Is it intrusive if I ask a show of hands here, who are you planning to have kids? Who of you are struggling to have kids? If I ask you who just gave up having kids after a long struggle, is it too intrusive to ask or do you feel too vulnerable to share? I felt too vulnerable to talk about my pregnancy. I wanted to say many things out loud, but I didn't. Things like, no, I cannot get out. I'm pregnant, I'm in constant pain, and I don't think I can go for two minutes without barfing. Or things like, I'm too scared of miscarriage again, just before second trimester. So I do understand if you feel vulnerable about to talk about your fertility state today. But I hope this talk will give you a new perspective. In 2012, I studied entrepreneurship. And I was excited about businesses with social impact. So I built mine around adult education for future skills and future of work. And in, clearly, women in the workplace gets a lot of attention. But what got my attention specifically was fertility. When you are trying to get pregnant and you cannot, everything becomes secondary. It's an exhausting burden that makes us lose sight of life and work. So I thought to myself, okay, infertility is a beast, but where is our emergency manual? Like every flight has. So in 2020, I started my latest initiative to help women to make informed decisions about their fertility through educational templates. And as soon as it became clear to me that I would like to work in fertility education, I started collecting data. I started to extensively follow more than 20 online groups. I signed up apps, and these groups are about trying to conceive advanced maternal age. I read hundreds of failed pregnancy stories, thousands and thousands of pregnancy test sticks shared by women in the hope of someone else sees a second faint line that indicates pregnancy. I know it sounds crazy, but who else would you ask if you are waiting for a positive result month after month? After month? Believe me, random strangers who are going through similar experiences are less judgmental and they feel for you. But my first time uh, real life connection related to fertility, the memory was from 23 years old. I shared a flat with a 35 year old woman. And that was the first time when I, had, when I had the chance to listen to a woman who wanted a baby so much and how devastating it was not being able to have one for more than 10 years. And around the same time, a young, naive version of myself asked a colleague at the workplace, you don't want kids? A blunt question, a terrible one. But she was very kind enough to tell me about her struggle, their struggle, that they're trying second time with the in vitro fertilization treatment known as IVF. So it was fascinating to me that this problem was so big, yet it was so undercover. You'd be amazed how many couples out there still trying to conceive after 20 years or more. And as an activist, I cannot accept the fact that many women's lives are centered around their ability to give birth. So as you can see, the first time I understood the consequences of infertility was when I was 23. It wasn't through school, nor family or friends. By the way, I found out later many of them had their own traumas. So infertility stories are not shared voluntarily and openly in our close circles. They're either hidden or they are mentioned in a shallow way, skipping the real struggle behind it. To be exact, 61% of people do not share fertility struggles with family and friends. So as we don't talk about these problems, there's a, a lack of empathy in society. And then there is knowledge gap. And I would like to show you some of examples of that knowledge gap. Everybody knows this, right? 
Even babies know this. It takes a male and a female to make a baby. But then why do we think immediately that there's something wrong with the woman when there's a struggle to get pregnant? According to a study from 2020, which aims to break the stigma that woman is carrying the infertility, proves that both male and female contributes to the infertility equally. One third. And the rest of the one third is pertaining to unexplained infertility, unknown reasons. And another study conducted with a sample of MBA students shows that more than 30% of the participants overestimated the possibility of women getting pregnant after 35 years old. More than 50% of the participants overestimated the success rate of IVF for, for women more than 40 years old. So there is a clear connotation, positive connotation, for having a baby later in life. And when in reality, the woman has diminishing egg reserves fast after the age of 35. And men has decreasing sperm quality after the age of 45. So there's a biological clock for both parties, not as we think only for women. The important question here is why this is all not yet common sense to us. And there are two main answers. The easy one and the short one, education. Most of us are raised with the culture of contraception over conception. And the second one, the, the second biggest reason for the knowledge gap is a little bit more complex. It is isolation. It's the emotional barrier that stops us from sharing our struggles. It's the mix of valid feeling like sadness, grief, and it's also feelings like guilt and shame that are brought on us by social standards. So let's have a look at what isolation does to us apart from contributing to the knowledge gap. It makes society believe everything is all right. It alters the public perception. Let me show you. A woman at work joining a social gathering who has been in the operation room just a few days ago. We don't talk about miscarriage to our colleagues or to our boss. We might not want the work to know that we're trying for a baby and it's okay, but it's an isolation scenario, pretending that everything is all right, but it shouldn't be like that. That is why the workplaces should include fertility options in their healthcare benefits so that the employees are supported mentally and financially so that they can focus on their work, give their full potential to the work. Another scenario, a happy couple holding a baby. What we do not know, it took them five years, three intrauterine inseminations, two IVFs, four miscarriages, and $50,000. It's like an iceberg. We get to see the happy ending of the story. Not the 120 hours spent on the clinic appointments per year, not the dozens of daily supplements, most importantly, not the draining effects of recovering from each procedure mentally and physically. So what happens when we do not share these painful experiences and isolate ourselves? Simply, systems do not support us. They are not designed for our needs. Let me give you an example. It was to my shock that Switzerland does not accept a pregnancy status before week 13 for healthcare insurance. That meant we had to pay all the medical bills, the doctor visits, the tests, the operation of the miscarriage. We felt defeated twice. Not only we lost the baby just a few days before week 13, but we also paid a huge bill. So this is a situation where the insurance system takes an advantage of a problem that is not being discussed enough. And otherwise, why they wouldn't cover a miscarriage? That is experience with one in four women, including healthy and young. That is why we need to talk about our painful experiences so we can build systems around them. 
We learned about isolation is a significant factor in knowledge gap. And the more knowledge gap we have, the more we isolate. How do we break this cycle? By simply sharing. That's me. When I shared my miscarriage story on YouTube, many friends, family, acquaintances bombarded me with messages telling me that this was their story too. I understand we are not designed to spread vulnerable news about ourselves, but I wish we did. I'm not saying it was easy, but I felt much less lonely. And yes, nowadays we have all online forums and apps that we can talk about our struggles with the people who are going through similar experiences. And this is a great way to find support to learn from each other. But this is still a bubble. Where we need actual help is in real life connections is in day-to-day -day life, where we can remove the stigma and minimize the social stress. This is why we need to normalize the fertility talk among each other so we can break the isolation knowledge gap cycle. But collectively, we need to do more because women and men globally are delaying the birth of their first child. In 2020, the average age of getting pregnant was 29 in Europe. It was 31 in Italy. So advanced age fertility is continued to be a topic that we need to address as a society. So let's summarize how we can address it. We need to teach our kids, girls and boys from a young, young age, what conception means. Use scientific terms for their body parts. Share with them the normal expectation of period, fertility. Let them understand that they have a decision power over their family planning. So they can decide if they want to freeze their eggs or sperms early on to give themselves a better chance later in life. We need to make adult education easier on fertility topics. Demand education plans from the government. Learn what the law says about our particular situation and talk about it. In my case, it was miscarriage. And it can be also aborting a pregnancy due to medical reasons. Make sure that our voice is heard. We need to increase awareness and normalize the fertility talk, starting with our own families, asking them what their experience was. Demand knowledge from the healthcare workers so that they can catch up with the latest studies by asking questions like, what is the latest research on the treatment you are suggesting to me? Or how can we increase the chances of having natural pregnancy? And demand, demand understanding better. So if we are not satisfied, we can find a second opinion or a third opinion without hesitation. Infertility journey is physical, mental, emotional, and financial. Demanding information is our compass. It will minimize the suffering. It will make us avoid making mistakes. And sharing our struggles will be our North Star for building better social systems. That is why together we need to navigate to a universe where fertility doesn't define who we are where we feel safe to talk to each other about fertility struggles, where singles, couples, LGBTQ people get their best chance at having a biological baby. And I would like to leave with a few words to the people who are suffering with infertility. Don't see yourself as a victim or less of value or incapable. This is not your fault. You are one in 45 million today, and your voice matters. Thank you.